Hey everybody, how's it going? We have a very, very exciting video today on LSTM time series forecasting. So this is probably the most requested video on my entire channel since it started. And so because of this, I really, really ask that you drop a like on this video, no matter who you are, because I know it's a very important topic and it needs to be taken seriously. And it also needs to be taken slow and nice and easy. So I'm here to explain that to you. Please go and drop a like on this video so it does nice and well and everyone can see it. So we're going to be uh, forecasting the temperature actually, okay? Nothing like the stock market. We're not ready for that yet. And if you really think you are, then go ahead and go do that. But today we're going to be taking it nice and slow and forecasting uh, basically the temperature, okay? So we're going to start out with our import statements as usual. We're going to be using TensorFlow and we'll import that as TF. We're going to import OS. We'll get pandas as PD and numpy as NP. Okay, that's pretty standard. And we're going to now just copy and paste this thing to get the data set. I don't really want to bore you with showing you all the details here, but I'll explain it. Basically, we're using the TensorFlow Cures Utils uh, get file to get it from this data set uh, here. You can see it's from TensorFlow data sets. And it's going to be about the climate, which is, you know, got to include the temperature as well as many other things. So I'll run that. And the most important thing is that we got this CSV path. So the CSV path is going to allow us to um, basically load this in as pandas. So we're going to call it as usual df is equal to pd.read csv with the csv path and df is right there. Okay, so I'm going to zoom out for a brief moment just to show you this, but I'll zoom back in shortly. It's a very big data set and I don't want to bore you with all of it. But basically, the, the important part is that this is the day of the year, the day of the month, or basically, not, not the day of the month, the month itself. So this is going to go from 0, 01 up to 31. This one's going to go from 0, 01 up to 12. And 2009, we can see in the end, that goes up until 2017. Okay? Uh, I guess the very beginning of 2017, so the end of 2016. We have quite a bit of information here, 420,000 rows. So basically, this is uh, all of these climate measurements in a particular area, it doesn't really matter where, uh, for 10 minute intervals. So that's, that makes sense why we have so many of these things. We have literally every 10 minutes for like 10, uh, eight years or so. So uh, we don't really want that much. I mean, maybe for, for your use case, if you're gonna spin off this, then you might, but we don't really want that much. So I'm gonna show you how to uh, take way less than that. We're gonna do DF is DF sub five. So starting from five, and then if we do the double colon, that says take every sixth only. And if we're if we mean take every sixth, well, we're, if we have ten minute intervals, this is really saying you know take every hour instead. So here is df dot head. And if you really want to see a little bit more than that, go ahead. But actually, that ruins it because you can't really call this twice. So I do have to call that uh, run it from back from the beginning if I want to do that. But yeah, we have this huge data frame, which now we have every hour. So it's one, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and that's going to start from the morning. So this is 24 hours clock. And yeah, so we have 70,000 uh, rows of data here, which are going to be very useful to us. And just so we can plot this a little bit easier, I'm going to be doing something uh, involving dates and dates are always weird. So I don't really want to dwell on this too much, but we're going to be using pandas date time function. So we'll set the index. Uh, which is going to be basically this column right here. The first one is the index here. We're going to be setting this index equal to the pandas dot two date time of df sub date time. Okay, luckily Colab grabs those names for us right like that. And then we can get the format is equal to, I again, don't really want to bore you with what this uh, is in particular, but at least with typing it, we can see that basically we're saying the format is the day dot so the day dot the month dot the year and then there's a space i guess and then our uh, month second okay so that's the that's the format of the data and if i do something like say i'm gonna for, i'm gonna purposely grab uh, like a particular day just say the first day up until you know 26 it's definitely that's going to be 26 hours so the first 26 hours are, are right there okay so so this is great but this is very complicated and yes absolutely you could you could look at all these variables and say, okay, maybe make some complicated time series forecasting model, uh, but we really don't want to do that. Here is T in degree C, and we're going to focus in on that one right there. So basically, uh, we can grab that very easily if I was to do something like make a variable called temp. Temp is equal to df sub, just grab that T degree C, and I don't know why it always makes too many quotes, 
and we can plot it like this. And that's why I bothered to make the index to be this column so that it knows that this is this date time where here over years, clearly we have this uh, recurrent pattern and it's not really surprising. We'd also have in a day, there's going to be fluctuations going up and down as well as uh, per year. We know that each year it's going to, it's going to go up and down as well. So we're going to see that pattern. And uh, yeah, we're gonna we're now gonna make a, a little bit of a complicated function. So bear with me on this one. It's not too bad, but uh, I want to take it nice and slow. So the idea is that uh, for these deep learning models, we need uh, the data always to be in some sort of input matrix. Uh, at least matrix is usually the term, unless unless it's more complicated than that, more variables, then it might be, uh, become a three or four D tensor. But for the most part. We're going to stick with just a matrix where each row is going to be our inputs and the, it has a corresponding label. So what I mean by this is we're going to end up with something and actually it's, it is going to be slightly more complicated than a matrix. But basically uh, for forecasting, we need to look at say, hey, the last five days or so. Um, for us, actually, we're going to use, since we have our increments, we're going to say at every maybe every five hours, we'll try to predict what the temperature is for the next hour, okay? Now, there's a lot of different choices here, but uh, for a forecasting model, a simple one that makes sense, where we look at say, okay, what was the temperature uh, at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, and five o'clock, that's five different measurements, and then we'll try to predict what it is for the six o'clock one. And then after we get that one, well, we would bump it over one step, where we'd say, actually, we don't care about one o'clock anymore. We'll take two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. That's again, another five, but we bumped over a step and the corresponding output is going to be what it was at seven o'clock, okay? We're gonna make this function where we, we change this thing into this sort of other matrix that looks something like this. And let me draw it out to you. It's going to look, uh, if I was to draw a comment, basically it would look like this, where we had one o'clock, so the temperature at one o'clock, I'll just uh, do one for short, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's going to be our first input and our corresponding output for that is going to be what it is at, and actually I said six there, that's been really, if I'm gonna stay consistent, that should be one, two, three, four, five. And then what it was at six o'clock. Okay, that's the corresponding output here. This thing I'm gonna call X, this whole thing is X and this whole thing here is why we're gonna build this up. And then the second row of each of them, well, we'd bump it over one step and we'd say, okay, this is then two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock. And the corresponding output is going to be at seven, okay? So you can see this kind of moved down here because after we saw these first five, we were guessing for this one but now we've guessed for that one. And so we, we bump one step over and we'd include that into our input to try and predict the next one. So this big long thing that we're creating here is gonna be our Y vector. And let me just show you one more so it's very clear. We would have the next one is gonna be three, four, five, six, seven. And then the next one is going to be eight and so on. We have to make this whole thing where this is our big X matrix and this is our big Y vector, okay? Where each of these are an input and this is the corresponding output. I know I just talked about that for a long time, but that's really the whole super most important thing in this, uh, other than just creating the model architecture uh, of what's going on here. This is supervised learning, converting a forecasting problem to a supervised learning problem. So we need to make this thing. And in fact, I'll show you, we actually need to make this thing where we wrap each of them in a list but it doesn't really matter. I can do that in the comments very quickly and as well in the code very quickly. It's it's really not hard as hard, hard at all. Um, you just wrap it in that because essentially if we were to do a multivariate, which means more variables, then you know maybe we would include other sorts of variables in these lists as well. Like maybe this would be temperature and this one would be pressure and this would be um, you know some other value as well, but we're not gonna do that. So don't worry about that. Let's create this function. So how do we do this? Well, we're gonna call it, uh, to start, it's gonna be called df2xy, okay? Where the x is going to be uh, this input thing, or th this big matrix, it's really a 3D tensor, um, but it's, it really looks like a matrix. So define to xy, and we'll give it, okay, df and window size, okay? What I mean by, what I mean by window size is that 
uh, we decided to take the last five five measurements here, except we don't necessarily want uh, this to be fixed in our code. We'll make it flexible. So we'll call the window size and you know maybe we'll just set it to be five for fun so that so that we're comfortable with that. Now we're going to quickly convert the uh, the data frame to NumPy. So we'll do df as NumPy is equal to df dot to NumPy. Okay, it's just that easy. And really the df, we actually are probably gonna call it with temp. And so that's just gonna be converted to this long vector. And that's totally fine. We got the values there so that we can kind of iterate over this thing in this weird window fashion to get the values. So at one at a time, we're gonna be building up this thing x, which is gonna start out as a list. And we're gonna be one at a time, bumping it up with each of these uh, these rows, basically. And forget that these mini brackets are here, we'll deal with that shortly. But basically we have to add this list of this is gonna be like the first five values. And then we need to add to y, which is gonna be this thing. We said y equal to this list as well. And it's gonna be this value. And then we're gonna append this value with uh, to y, and then we'll append these values to x all at once. So we're gonna be going through, adding say this thing and to x and then this to y adding this all to x and then this to y and so on until we got the whole thing. So to do that, we will do for i in the range of the length of df as numpy. Okay, so we're just going through um, going through this thing with an, with an index. That's pretty standard. Uh, and we'll actually find later that we're going to have an error unless we do minus the window size um, because it, basically we'd start to get out of bounds. You could, you could really look into it if you wanted to, but it's not a big deal. Um, and then we could do x dot append with what? Well, we need to add in this row thing. And let me just grab this row first in a different variable. But this row is going to be, uh, first, let me just show you, it's going to be df, df as numpy for, with i, okay, with i from, or from i until i plus five, okay? So what that does is says, okay, whatever i is right now, take just the next was it including it and then the next four so really five values so make that the row and then to get in this extra little format here where we need the brackets we can do a little trick here where we can just say the list of the list of a for a in this thing okay so that just wraps each of those values into one of these brackets uh, and and then that's just what the model is going to like it happens to like that input Okay, and then we can in append the row, and we can also append into y, well, the label, I like to call it the label, it's the true actual value for the input, uh, for that input row, and that label is going to be df as numpy sub i plus five. Okay, so this thing, this member doesn't include i plus five, it's going to be uh, just the first five, and then after that, it's going to include the next one here. If you actually say just this i plus five, it'll be the next one over. Okay, and then we can uh, we can append the label with y dot append the label, and we can return after all of this stuff the numpy dot array. So I'm turning that weird list thing into a numpy array. That's important. We could have done it later, but I want to do it now. We'll return the tuple of the numpy array of x and the numpy array of y. Okay. And then what will we, uh, how will we call this thing? We can set, say, the window size equal to maybe five. We can set x and y equal to df to xy, that's our function, with something, let's make it, uh, say, temp. Okay, that's easiest right now. That's what we're gonna stick with. And we'll give it the window size. Okay, and now we can say x.shape. I always like to output shapes so that we can see what we're doing. x.shape and y.shape we can see we have 70,086. Does that make sense? Well, we have uh, up here, did we ever actually see there? 7,091, that kind of makes sense that we're missing five there. Don't think too much about it, but if you really want to drill down, this does make sense. Uh, 70,086, five by one, okay? Uh, and if you really want to see it, basically it's this thing where it's printed in a worse format, the exact same thing in comments that I wrote out here. And then there's the corresponding label as well. If we go down to don't go down to ask what y is, then y is going to be just each of the values, and we don't have to wrap those in brackets. That's totally fine. 
Okay, I'm going to delete those cells because we don't really need them. And now we are ready to split this into train tests and uh, validation sets. You know, you want to train the model on some data. We want to validate it uh, to make sure that it's actually being able to generalize and predict on new information. Another split into a test set, we'll say X train and Y train is equal to, we're just going to split this in order here, X from 60,000 like that and y sub y sub 60,000 with the index there with the colon there so basically that says the first 60,000 rows that makes sense with 70,086 there uh, we can change this to I'll change this to test and val this is going to be val and that's going to be val that's going to be test and that's going to be test okay so here we're going to switch this to maybe say 60,000 up until 65,000. And again, the same sort of uh, indexing in there will work just fine. And finally, we can just say the rest, okay? Give the rest to test. That rhymed, that's perfect. We're gonna put the colon at the end there, splitting the data up like that. And again, like always, I love to output the shapes of everything. X train dot shape, uh, Y train, Y train dot shape x val dot shape x I'm sorry y val dot shape and x test dot shape and y test dot shape the, the first 60,000 are for uh, the the training set it's each of them are going to be five the windows of five and we're just going to be one here which is why we it's it's we wrapped it in that little list here it's just saying one variable of interest so we have sixty thousand of, of this this input here and then we have the labels we have something very similar but less uh, for the validation and a little bit more the last bit for the test okay so after that we are ready to compile our model and it's going to be training on this training set of information so we're going to do a whole bunch of tensorflow specific imports like um, tensor from tensorflow dot curious dot models import we'll get we'll get sequential we will do from tensorflow dot curious dot layers we're just going to import star to be lazy but honestly uh, you know you could write them out if you wanted to from tensorflow at tensorboard we don't need that from tensorflow dot curious dot layers no not layers callbacks import model checkpoint this is for saving models we're going to just save the model that does best on the validation from tensorflow.curas.callbacks we want to import um no i keep reading it wrong i'm sorry for that losses import the mean squared error okay so that that is uh for that makes sense as our loss function basically so it's the mean squared error which is you know the it is the mean squared error we sum over the squared distances between the actual value which is that real temperature that that label here and what our model predicted so if we sum uh, if we square the differences of those we sum all of them and then we we take the average that uh, gives us the mean squared error we don't really need this but for fun we're going to output the uh the tensorflow dot curious dot metrics um import import root mean squared error okay so that's really just going to be the square root uh, of the of the mean squared error there it's really just for us to look at and then from tensorflow dot curious dot optimizers we're going to import atom okay and now let's make our model so what do we want to do we always make a sequential model like this or at least generally we use the sequential api we are going to specify the input as usual so model one dot add input layer okay we give it an input layer and specify the shape it's going to be five by one so this one we generally ignore the batch so this is the the number of uh, uh, information that we have and then each of those they are going to be a five by one vector pretty much so we specify that there and model one dot add here's where we do the lstm so we can do something simple and say maybe 64 here all right i'm not going to explain all about the the secrets of LSTM and the math behind it, I don't think it's that important. Uh, for now, just know that, you know, we're gonna pass this into this uh, this complex recurrent neural network here. Uh, well, I mean, complex is actually the most simple one there is really. Um, you could also use GRU if you wanted to, look into that and play around with that if you want to, uh, but that's what we're gonna use today. And we'll do model.add, model1.add, 
Dents with 8 and Relu. Okay, so after that, we convert this to 8 Relus. And finally, we have to make this model one dot add dense with one and linear. Okay, we want a linear value. We're trying to predict some temperature, which is going to be a positive or negative value. So we just want that to be linear. That's important. So finally, we can do model one dot summary to make sure that everything works as we expected there. And we can see, yes, uh, it takes in a five by one. It turns it into this, uh, this 64 LSTM thing. We convert it to eight and then finally to one value at the very end. That's what's most important. Now to specify our training callbacks, we're going to do CP is equal to model checkpoint, model checkpoint with model slash uh, model one slash, by the way, I'm saying model one uh, in case you wanted to go ahead and make different models. Uh, I'm really just going to stick with the one out of simplicity, but absolutely go ahead and make your own if you wanted. What I just did here is set save best only equal to true, which means um, I want to only, well, only save the best model, which is going to be defined uh, automatically by saying the one that has the lowest validation uh, loss, which is really what we care about the model uh, predicting well on new unseen information. We will do model one dot compile with setting the loss equal to a short form for the mean squared error is loss is MSE. I mean, I guess since we already imported it earlier, I should probably doing uh, be doing loss is equal to mean squared error like that. I suspect that'll work. If we error with that, that's fine. Optimizer, well, it's fine, but I'll change it. We're going to set the optimizer equal to Adam with a small learning rate at first. And if you don't know what the learning rate is, basically, and I'm going to make this really small, actually, 0 0.0001 actually, make it nice and small. Uh, basically, the higher this number is, the faster the model is going to try and uh, decrease the loss but we don't want to decrease super, super quickly. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to find its maximum uh, or the local minimums, basically. So we're also going to specify metrics is equal to the root mean squared error, bracket, bracket, as we defined earlier. And that should be just fine. So here it's going to save only the best model to the model one directory. We can load that up pretty easily afterwards. We're going to fit the model, model one dot fit with we're going to pass it x train and y train and the validation data validation data is going to be the x val and the y val okay so it's going to measure the performance on this data set as well in every epoch epoch is just a run through the dating data set we'll set epochs equal to 10 to 10 runs through the data set for the training data set and we want to run this callback, which is just this function. We're going to make sure it calls back this uh, the CP thing after every epoch to see if it wants to save the model, depending on if the model, uh, if the validation loss was higher or lower than it was before. It's only going to save it uh, based off of the absolute minimum uh, that it's seen validation loss. So we'll run that, and let's let it watch or let's, uh, let's watch it go. So it's it's rapidly decreasing the loss. It would be decreasing it a lot faster if we were uh, had a bigger number here, but I, play, I played around with this a little bit earlier and I was pretty happy with this learning rate. Again, as an experiment for sure, uh, if you wanna go and play around with that value and, and, and uh, see what you can get out of it as well, then by all means do that. I'm gonna let this go for a little bit and I'm just gonna uh, cut to after this is done training and we'll talk about it there. Okay, and it appears that we're done training here. I apologize for the absolute word vomit here. Uh, but basically, if you find it, we can see that loss went down every single time on the training set, which is pretty common. And sorry for the headache, root mean squared error accordingly would go down as well. It's just the square root. And the validation loss, which is most important, is going down, it's going down, it's going down. And it actually, you know, it's saved on not quite the last one, but the lowest one was here, 0 0.4909, and it's saved there. So we can go ahead and load the model that it actually saves. I mean, technically it still has uh, this model in, um, in memory if, with model one, but we wanna load back the one that had the lowest validation loss. And we do that with model, uh, model one. Actually, we need a quick import here. We can do from tensorflow.curas.models, we'll import load model, it brings the model into memory. Model one is equal to load model with model one slash, give it that directory and it imports it, uh, well, not imports it, Some, someone I, I know actually uses that term a lot uh, for what this is called, but no, it loads it into memory, and there it is. So now what we're gonna do is uh, get 
just make a pandas data frame and we're going to make three one for train test and validation um, for just showing where all the trains where all the predictions are compared to the actual label and to do that it's very easy we can get the train predictions is equal to model one dot predict on x train that actually uh, creates kind of that weird thing where we have a vector uh, of, of predictions, except each of the values is actually wrapped in a list themselves, like, kind of like our input matrix was before. We don't really want that, so what we do is flatten, and that just makes uh, gets rid of those inner brackets like that. And we will also get train results, which is going to be our pandas data frame. Train results is pd dot data frame dot data frame of data is equal to. We'll make two columns here, just train predictions and the actuals. So this is going to be called uh, train predictions and that value, uh, sorry, I missed the, the brace for the dictionary. Data is going to be this dictionary where here's the first, here's the first column. Train predictions is going to be just, um, well, train predictions. That's not really that surprising. And the next key and uh, value, which is the next column is going to be actuals. And we will set that equal to, this is just going to be Y train as the actual labels. And we can output this with train results is invalid syntax. I always do that. That is a brace and then bracket, and that should be right. Okay, it takes a little bit of time to make the predictions, not too long. And here you go. We have a data frame that has compared the predictions to the actuals. And unsurprisingly, as we saw in the loss, since the loss was pretty good, uh, it's pretty low. You know, we're pretty accurate here. There's some some bigger mistakes like 7.1 uh, compared to 9.8, uh, but in general, you know, it's pretty darn close. And let's actually take a little bit about uh, look at the plots a little bit. So plotting, you know, something very easy, not my favorite um, plotting library if you guys know me well, but import matplotlib.pyplot is plt because it's nice and easy. Plt dot, uh, that's plot dot plot, plt dot plot, and we'll plot the train results. So we're just plotting a curve that shows both the, the, the actual predictions compared to the uh, or the predictions compared to the actual results, train results, sub train predictions, plot that column. And then let's maybe only take the first 100 or so just because it zooms. Actually, let me, show you, let me show you what it looks like without that just to kind of prove to you why we want to change it there. And then we'll do train results, sub actuals. Okay, so comparing the predictions to the actuals you can see it looks like this. So that's why I kind of want to show maybe just like a hundred results or maybe honestly, even just 10 random ones. So this is, that's not really random. That's the first 10. Uh, but looking at the first 10, we can see, you know, it's pretty close. And then if we zoom out, uh, you know, a little bit more, that's not what I meant. Uh, if we look at, you know, maybe the first hundred results, you know, we can see we're still pretty close. And if we were to look at say, you know, 50 to a hundred, the, the second 50, is you know it follows it very well so it's training it's trained off of the last uh you know five hours of uh, of data and it's able to predict given five uh, the next one very very well okay so that's quite interesting and now we are going to look at how it did on the validation data so that's training uh we don't really care about how well it did on training because it's already seen that data before we want it to generalize and so to do this we are going to copy um, actually, to save time, I'm really just going to copy the, the stuff that's from my other notebook here. It's really common sense because we're just changing tests or tra changing train to val every time. So every time we see train, 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 we're just changing it to val. So here we can do it like that. And there you go. So that's that's the comparison. We can get the plot as well. I'll just look at the, say the first 100 validation results like that. And again, I'm just changing the above code to val. It's really nothing crazy. You can look at it if you want to. But, uh, you know, we're very, very, very close. It's awesome. And then finally, what uh, has really, really never been seen in the slightest uh, is the test, test data. So the last, uh, the last 5,000 or so, whatever we picked. So test results, I'm just, again, copying and pasting the exact same thing, but changing val or train uh, to test. There's our test predictions. We can see it's very, very good. And finally, we have the test 
shows it did a, did a very good job. Okay, so that is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a great introduction to time series forecasting. Please subscribe and drop, drop a like if you haven't already. And I'm definitely going to make more LSTM forecasting models uh, in the future. This is just the bare bones, you know, minimum thing you could do. But I think it's a really nice example to show what's everything that's going on here. So drop a like, subscribe, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one.